If you remember last week, I closed on this slide. This slide is um, from the film uh, Forbidden Planet. And he was telling a story about this uh, lost civilization that were, had left no evidence of themselves whatsoever and suggested that perhaps we could gain some knowledge about what they look like from this door, this characteristic arch. And uh, suggesting that they have a kind of they were kind of fat, I think, is basically what the suggestion was. But the idea that architecture um, discusses the body and discusses our relationships to the body, the nature of the body, is going to be something we see over and over and over again. And as we go into more specific buildings, we'll, that'll become an important theme for us. But the real issue here that I, I'm interested in, and the reason for this lecture today, is that, it's that architecture all of a sudden is not about, some, not about comfort or familiarity or convenience or pride. It's about, it's another way to tell stories. Um, and then there are gonna be two principles in this class that I'm just basically gonna take for granted. One is that um, every, kind, every discipline, whether it's mathematics, engineering, medicine, any of the arts, they each tell us stories about ourselves. Uh, moreover, each discipline tells us, can tell any story. But the thing that's interesting is that each discipline tells certain stories better than any others, and some, and also each discipline tells. So that makes uh, architecture interesting, and the way we teach it here is primarily in terms of the way it can tell us stories about ourselves, who we are, who we were, who we might be in the future, what we think, how we relate to one another. And in particular, architecture is particularly interesting about how we relate to one another because it's so big and it costs so much. It, it basically intrudes relentlessly into the public domain. And so more often than not, we view architecture today as, having a, as discussing the relationship between individuals and the collective. And that'll come in a little bit later. Um, but because architecture is a storytelling medium, or it's one of the things it can do besides comfort and convenience and all those other things, is to tell stories, it has a very interesting relationship to film. And uh, uh, I'm going to start off with this film. This is from Rear Window. <coughs> uh, Rear Window is a film by Hitchcock. There are a few directors who I think are particularly interesting in their relationship to architecture, although it's going to be true. These are not, these are not great films. These are not films that are... That are spectacularly interesting in their relationship to architecture, it will be true that whatever film you go to, or actually whatever book you read, or whatever you do, what TV show you watch, there's going to be something in it about architecture helping the story along, no matter what. You cannot go see a film, or you can't read a story where that's not true. And it's also true that there'll be something in it about landscape helping something along. Uh, but in this particular case, this is a spe specifically architectural film called Rear Window. These are uh, Federalist houses that, in New York City. T to be honest with you, this is a stage set which was built as an almost exact duplicate of some existing houses in New York City. And the reason they had to rebuild it is that the houses, the apartments are too thick. In other words, as you tried to film through the window in a real building, you couldn't actually see all the action that Hitchcock needed you to see. And not only that, all the windows reflected light too much. So this is a movie about life in an apartment house as seen through a window that unfortunately apartment houses and windows got in the way. But it tells us an interesting story about our relationship to windows. And so what happens is uh, the direct, the, there's a guy in the film, Jimmy Stewart, he's got a broken leg, He's sitting around looking out the rear window of his house, and he starts to look at the various people's lives. And he, you know, he gets a pair of glasses, and he becomes interesting. He's a metaphor for the director, some people say. And you know, just, he's just watching. He, this is Mrs. Lonely Hearts, and he just kind of watches their lives unfold. And as he watches their lives unfold, he starts to notice a really curious thing, and that this woman in the right disappears. And he gets convinced that Raymond Burr, who will later go on to play a great lawyer, and a great police chief, uh, in this particular film is the murderer, has murdered his wife. And as his, his interest gets, notice the camera changes. And there are people who see a Freudian implication in that change. And he starts to take pictures, and then he, uh, he, I'm stuck. Oh, no, I'm not. So, you know, and he, uh, the, the mystery unfolds all through the windows. And there's the lighting problem. So this entire um, 
film is essentially about the kind of excerpts of people's lives. You don't, can't see the whole thing, but the voyeuristic impulses that we have and that the way when we relate to buildings, we automatically sort of do that. In fact, my wife likes to ride around at night to look in people's houses when the lights are on because you can actually see better. Uh, that's not true. That's just another one of my... Let me show you an early Hitchcock film. Um, this is a film called... This is a silent film. Hitchcock made three films. The story here is that the, the character you're about to see walking on the floor is a serial killer. And he's moved into this as a lodger into this family's house. And they're becoming more and more and more suspicious that he's a serial killer. And so they hear him pacing after what'll happen, what happens is there's a murder. And then the next night they hear him pacing. And this happens five times. So at this point in the film, they're starting to think maybe he's the murderer. And, and then this is what you see. All of these are continuations on the idea of the, the, the way architectural sets up transparencies into our lives and ourselves as opposed to views. Okay, so we'll just watch this clip. There's some funny movie. Now watch. So this is the killer. That's the family below. They're looking up at the ceiling. The lights are shaking because it's a low rent, rents are cheap and so. And this is the incredible shot. This is a groundbreaking shot because what, he, what you see is the stalker, I mean, with the serial killer from below. And in order, did y'all see it? Could y'all see it okay? I can't really tell from the lights. Uh, so in order to do that, Hitchcock, again, it's really what he did was, uh, let's see if I can back up for a second. He built a giant set with, with a full-scale room and then made a glass floor out of it. So you can actually look up and see the, the oh, I bet you didn't see it. So do not Twitter stuff like, apparently unable to control his own computer. <laughs> you can say, nice haircut. See that? So, in order, here's the issue is the, the architect, I mean, the filmmaker knows that the, that the architecture is going to be part of the story and that that relationship is important to show, but no building does that. And again and again and again, we're going to find situations in which architecture is operating in a way that actually it's very difficult for a building actually to do. On the other hand, uh, this is maybe the last of our windows. This is a scene from In Cold Blood. In Cold Blood uh, was a book written by a man named Truman Capote, um, very famous bon vivant writer from New York City who went out and uh, he needed a bestseller. Basically, he needed a bestseller because his best friend, Harper Lee, had just had a bestseller called uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, which is also a good movie. Um, and there's been recently a lot of movies that tell the story. What he did was he heard about a murder in Kansas um, and this is a, he, so he decides to go write a novel based on the murder of a family by these two uh, itinerant criminals. Um, they're caught and they're captured. They're tried over a number of years and eventually put to death. And he invents an entirely new kind of novel. And that is essentially, he tells a story like a journalist would be reporting it in the newspapers. Uh, so he invents a new kind of, so in other words, no psychological insights into the killing, no sympathy for the family, no sympathy for the killers, just a kind of straight, stark, dark, black and white telling of the facts, but done in such a way in a novel style, no? You know, there was a time once when we almost had it made, just the two of us. He was in a fever. About some new project up in Alaska. A hunting lodge for tourists. It was gonna make us a fortune better than a gold mine. But most of all, it was gonna be something we never had before. A real home. We got it built, too. Just him and me, side by side. The day the roof was finished, he danced all over it. 
I never was so happy in all my life. It was a beautiful home. But no tourists ever came. Nobody. We just lived there all alone in that big, empty failure. Till he couldn't stand the sight of me. I think it happened. I was eating a biscuit. He started yelling what a greedy, selfish bastard I was. Yelling and yelling until I grabbed his throat. I couldn't stop myself. He tore loose, got a gun. He said, look at me, boy. Take a good look, because I'm the last living thing you're ever going to see. And he pulled the trigger. But the gun wasn't loaded. He began to cry. All like a kid. I went for a long walk. When I got back, the place was dark. The door was locked. All my stuff was piled outside in the snow where he threw it. I walked away and never looked back. I guess the only thing I'm gonna miss in this world is that poor old man and his hopeless dreams. I'm glad you don't hate your father anymore. But I do. I hate him. And I love him. It, it, it really works. I suggest it to you. Now, I know that when you first watch this scene and you think I'm telling you it's about architecture because he's telling the story about building a house. And that's true. It's a story about the relationship between a father and a son. And it's not accidental that what they're going to do is build a house together. It's a common thing. But what's really important about this scene and why this scene is uh, considered such an, his piece, an important piece of film history is that in the book, there's no emotional content whatsoever. You don't know anything about, all you know is that this person seems to not be able to feel any feelings whatsoever. And as he's telling the story, he doesn't seem to have any feelings. But if you look carefully, he's cr the, window, the rain on the window makes him cr seem like he's crying. I guess the only thing I'm going to miss in this world is that poor old man and his hopeless dreams. I'm glad you don't hate your father anymore. But I do. I hate him. And I love him. Now, in this case, the window is not about views or light or any of that sort of stuff. It's the, what's going on is the material effect of the glass. And you actually have seen this in your, you know, I suppose most of you have seen this. You're at night, you're... A car comes down the road, and all of a sudden, the headlights are reflected through the glass, and shadows dance on the wall. It's a really, it's a really special sort of ballet on the wall. And so the materiality here is the first time we've seen it, it's the material itself that's causing the effect. The interesting thing about this scene is that uh, the, the stage prop, it was by accident. The stage prop who set it up originally put the, the window fan, put the fans for the, to keep the lights cool too close to the windows, and it was blowing the water on the windows, and you can see it was really dripping heavy on the sill. He got fired as soon as they got seen, they saw the rushes, and then the director saw it and said, no, no, it's one of the great, you know, great pieces of cinematography, and I think they gave him his job back. I'm not really sure about that, but it would be a nice thing if they did anyway. And I, like I promised you last week, you cannot trust any of these stories I'm telling you because I'll just, whatever. Now, not everything has to be serious in a movie that's about architecture, but you can learn. There's architectural theory in every interaction between a character. You can just leave them off if you want. It's up to you. It's fine. 
Okay. Um, this is Superman 3. Now, do y'all know Superman, right? In this movie, he's been infected by red kryptonite. Red kryptonite changes Superman in unpredictable ways. Sometimes it makes him, you know, grow funny parts or behave differently, go crazy. I don't know. He's just a, it's a funny thing. But in this particular case, the red kryptonite has turned him into an evil person. And then he, he has to act against the world in a way to show he's the most evil guy in the world. And so the directors have a problem. They can't have him really do anything terribly bad because later on he has to become a hero again. So he has, they have to figure out something he can do which shows just how unbelievably e evil he is although, and that he can recover from and no one gets hurt. And so what he does is he straightens up the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Um, and that... In that, in that moment, everyone knows, God, what a horrible guy this is, because this is one of the most popular buildings in the entire world. And it's the first, it's the granddaddy of all unbelievably weird buildings. Uh, and so it's kind of funny, because he can't, I had to do this just to show you, he's trying to straighten it out. <laughs> Apparently it's hard, because watch him at the end, he's, he can't get it to last a little bit. Now, the Leaning Tower is really an interesting building. When they first started the building, it started to lean as, uh, because of the foundation failed. And the architect freaked out, and he didn't want it to lean, and so he started to curve it back. He, bu he built the columns on the leaning side higher. So if you go see it real carefully, it not, not only leans, it curves back. But, of course, when he started to build the columns bigger on the side to curve it back, they got heavier, and it started to lean some more. So. But it's been up there for 400 years, and this was the first. This is, this is the reason we do all the strange buildings that we're going to be discussing over the next... A few years now. This is one of the, another of the really famous architecture movies. This is called Fountainhead, and uh, he, Gary Cooper is playing a, a character based on a very famous living architect, architect named Frank Lloyd Wright. He's been given the chance to give a commission, and he presents this building. And they love the building, but they want to make a few changes. And so they give him the contract. Like, he's happy. But then they show him the changes. So they just want to decorate it a little bit. Now, this is the life of the architect. <laughs> if you go outside, this is what's happened all over Columbus. It used to look like this, it used to look like that, and now they've made it look like this. And that's called postmodernism. And we're going to, so what's really interesting about this is that this movie was 20 years before it actually started to happen in the history of architecture. But as you pay attention to those things, you realize that that's not, that's just cardboard. It's not holding anything up. Those columns don't hold anything up. Those windows don't really do anything. It's just about creating a kind of image. And that idea that architecture can be just about making a certain image, that it doesn't have to function, it doesn't have to carry any weight, it doesn't have to do anything but make an image, is an important part of the field, an important part of what we're going to be discussing. It, it's a little bit like you get to dress up, and as you dress up in different clothes, you're going to feel differently and you're going to behave differently. Uh, this idea, let's see if I can do this. This is a scene from The Gladiator. Y'all ever see The Gladiator? Y'all know any of these movies? I'm really glad because I don't play many games, any video games. Although I, at the end I try to pretend like I did, so don't worry. The Gladiator, let's see, that's it, okay. Now what, this is, one of, this is a good scene. Lights. play. Have you ever seen anything like that before? I didn't know men could build such things. That's not only a scene from uh, the film The Gladiator, that's a scene from a movie I did about the work of an architect named Frank Gehry, which you're going to be seeing one week, because I'm going to decide to take a week off for the heck of it. So I'm just going to make you come here and sit down and watch a movie that I made. That scene will be in it. Why that scene's important 
is, uh, this is at the beginning of the film. Um, the, the character, I've forgotten his name, played by uh, the, the Australian architect whose name I've also forgotten. Mumble louder. <laughs> Russell Crowe, thank you. You know, he's, he was a, the, the whole thing, I, I, you probably noticed, the movie is really a retelling of the story of Moses. You know, it's actually a Bible story, and Russell Crowe is really Moses, but they can't do it. I don't know why, because they've already got the Ten Commandments, so they can't make it again, so they decided to make it the gladiator. But he gets, he's, a, he's royalty in Rome, and he gets kicked out and becomes a slave, and he meets uh, Jaimon Hanshu, uh, who's the actor that's walking in with him, and he's a, been a lifetime slave. And they walk in, and Jaimon Hanshu says, looks at the Colosseum and said, uh, I had no idea man could do such things, or man could build such things. Um, now, why is that important? It's important because it foreshadows the entire story. The unbelievable, unimaginable achievement of the Colosseum, all of a sudden, he starts to imagine that he, as a man, can start to imagine that he could do things that he never imagined himself possible. And at the end, that means setting himself and his colleagues free. And so the, the, the grandeur of the achievement of architecture here is used as to forecast the fact that the, the grandeur of achievement by any person in relationship to their discipline becomes evidence that we can all do that. And it's one of the ways architecture operates in our storytelling is, is, is in that sense, is basically to make us understand uh, the, the kinds of powers that we have that we didn't know we had. Okay. Slideshow next. All right. I don't, I don't really need to start this over every time, I guess. But that's pretty funny. Let's watch that here. <laughs> Do anybody recognize this building? This is a movie called uh, Little Man Tate. Now, this is a version of the last movie in the sense that this is a school for unbelievably brilliant young children, super gifted intellectual children, and th when the director is trying to think of where to shoot this, he shoots it at the Wexner Center because at the time it was understood to be by an unbelievably smart act architect done for unbelievably smart people, which meant not done for anyone else on earth. And so uh, the building came to represent a kind of intellectual possibility that had not been imagined in building it. In that sense, the Wexner Center in this film is exactly like the Coliseum in the last film. It becomes a symbol of achievement, and it becomes the setting for the achievement. What's particularly interesting, this is the black box theater in the Wexner Center. I don't know if you've ever been in there, but all that scaffolding on the side is not there. That's actually been put in by the set director as a quote. It's, it's, it's actually the quotation of the scaffolding on the outside because there wasn't enough intellectual stuff on the theater, so he put it in. And now you understand the Wexner Center completely. Uh, the idea also that architecture is a, something that lifts us into another form of existence is obviously celebrated in this, uh, in 2001. Y'all know 2001? It's now a history film. It's like 1984. This happened about eight years ago. I, I don't know if y'all know. It was on Jupiter, so you might have missed this. But uh, the big, this big monolith, which is in exactly in Pythagorean proportions, meaning... The, the, the proportions of the sides of this monolith also form the sides of a right triangle. So they're Pythagorean. And so, I don't know how it does it. I don't, know if that, I don't even know if that's true, but I've read that. Uh, I'm not even sure that's true, but I've heard it. Um, so the, the apes come up and they, they touch it. And all of a sudden, they start to become intelligent and they start to use tools. And, the, you know, there was never, in the film, it's not clear. Is there some secret power? in the monolith, or is it just the encounter with uh, an act of intelligence so far beyond theirs that just the encounter with it itself is enough to push them forward into another state of self-consciousness? And um, I'll leave it to you to decide that. The film, you'll notice it's exactly the same building. What's, the film is also important because it, was, it's, it has this really wonderful sense of what design in the future is going to be like. These are the Russians meeting the, uh, the, the guy who's about to go to the moon to try to figure out what the, monolith, the big monolith. There's three monoliths uh, around uh, the film. There's one on the Earth, there's one on the moon that's been buried, and there's a gigantic one out in Jupiter. And it turn turns out to be an alarm system. 
those big blocks, they're not anything special, they're just an alarm. To let the, let the aliens know we've woken up and made it to the moon and therefore are about to go screw with them. You know, it's kind of like, uh-oh, they've made it to the moon, they're not going to be far away, we better put a stop to them. So, uh, but all of these sets and designs, this is done in 1968, and so all of that furniture had to exist, and, and Kubrick's sense of what it would, how do you use the contemporary design environment to project a realistic sense of the future is uh, famous in this film. It's particularly interesting because in 1958, um, I guess that's 10 years earlier, there is this thing, there is a, you know, they have these like World's Fair. This is a World's Fair in Belgium, and this really silly building called the, uh, what's it called, the Atomium, or the Atom Atomium. You can go visit it today. Uh, inside it, however, all of the sensibilities are 2001 are already in place. And so it's fairly clear that Kubrick and his set, does, this is the staircase in the Antomium, and this is the set for the um, inside 2001. This is the sensibility, the same color schemes. This is the, at the time, was the world's fastest elevator. You would go from one little bulb to the next on this thing, and it, would be, it was clear on the top, and it produced this kind of effect. And it was these sort of special effects that Douglas Turnbull did in the 2001. So in 1958, architects built the Atomium, started to produce a sense of effects that filmmakers anticipated or understood would anticipate, but obviously not as good as the film version of it. Then the film version recapitulates that in new, new design. And you get a conversation among media, among practices, about what the world looks like now, what it looks like in the future. It's obvious one thing is true, is in the future there will be no color in architecture. Everything is going to be white. This is obvious. This is the most famous prediction of the future. Obviously it's old because it's not white, it's green. But if you remember, uh, this is um, the arrival in Emerald City from the Wizard of Oz. Do you know any, do any, any of you know how they made the Emerald City? How, how whenever you see the Emerald City in the film, you know how they did it? It's a painting about this big. And they just take a camera shot. It's, this is a painting. And you can, you know, it's like that big. So every time you see the Emerald City in the distance, it's just that. But if you notice, it's gigantic, uh, beautiful, sleek, sleek towers, this way of imagining modernity in the future. And this is made in 1939. The, the painting was done in 1938. So we're not yet making this architecture, though when you go see something like uh, Minority Report, you can see it. However, in the movie about the Krell, you can remember that he, discuss, he says, they're towering, they're towering buildings of porcelain, glass, and adamantine steel have long since crumpled to the ground. So there's a kind of persistence about this city of God imagination about what it's going to be like to go to a perfect city in the future. On the other hand, architecture is used to set moods for other reasons. This is the Bates Hotel in Psycho. Um, now, I just wanted to show you some of the way it, it's obviously there to set a mood. It's a, it's a set, stage set. There it is as a stage set. It's actually, on the other hand, based on a painting by Edward Hopper, which in turn is a painting on a, based on a house in Lima, Ohio. So Edward Hopper was on a, on a trip to California. He went through Ohio and Kentucky. He painted this painting. It's called House by the Railroad. And it later on becomes, has this kind of eerie capacity to set the kind of mood that uh, Hitchcock uses in Psycho. But, Probably if we're going to look to horror, my favorite building, obviously you can find all kinds of night, all kinds of haunted houses and stuff like that, but my favorite architectural discussion in any horror movie is in the movie called The Shining by Kubrick. Uh, not the one that they did on TV, which was... That's... Uh, is it Oregon? Yeah, it's called the uh, something... Wait. Treetop Lounge, Treetop Hotel, no, no, not Treetop Lounge. Anyway, this is a real building. And you, and you can see, and they drive up, and this is where the story takes place. Now, from, an archi from a traditional architect's point of view, you can understand immediately how this building was designed. It was designed to fit into its landscape. You'll notice that the materials match the color of the, uh, of the mountain as it, uh, before the green of the spring comes in. Also the little peak is a little echo of the peak behind it. So it's a very um, genteel way 
to blend in with your surroundings. And it has, so in a sense, it's, it's architecture from the point of view that we were talking about comfort and convenience and you know, pride and, and being pretty. It's, it's the most benign and successful of architects. It was of architectures. It was built by in the New Deal, uh, enacted by Fred, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. And everything was handmade. So he, he took all the out of work artists that were around and they made this entire house by hand. Everything inside, everything outside is by hand. One thing that's particularly interesting about the house, it has no elevators. Um, now, another thing that's interesting about the house is it has this maze. See this maze? It's a hedge maze. And so normally when you ask architects what they like about this movie, they will always refer to this hedge maze. Uh, it's not really what I like about this movie because there's something else going on in this movie architecturally. And all I'm trying to get you to do is start to look for these kind of things. The way, not just that the architecture appears in the movie, but the way it kind of structures the story. So this is Jack Nicholson looking down on the hedge maze. And this is sort of the view, this is the view of the architect that every architect loves. And this is the picture from the film that, every, you know, he, they're in charge. They're looking down like God. There's a perfect geometry and they've done it. And this view is the view of the actual hedge maze out the window. So as he looks down on this, the, the camera cuts to this. And all of a sudden there's these two little people. I don't know if you can see them. Remember the, remember the point? Remember, follow my finger and exactly where it intersects the street. See? There they are. <laughs> look in the middle, in the very middle, and look on the far left of the very middle, you'll see some bodies. And it's, it's the little boy and his mother, and they're playing around. But that, that, that's called the plan view. That's the overhead view. It's the power view. It's the view. It's why when you go to China now, you see so many 360-degree uh, um, on the high rise of buildings, you see 360 degree panorama glass restaurants. There's this incredible sense of power over the world to be that high up and to be seeing everything. It's called a panopticon view. Uh, this is a beautiful, oh, how about that? There's. Uh, you should look carefully at this. This is a really famous scene from uh, the film. It's a scene that has several uh, features about it that you should recognize. First of all, it's an elevator. There's no elevators in this uh, hotel. The, fa the fact of the matter is, this movie is shot in five locations, but almost entirely on a soundstage, and the only shots whatsoever of that first hotel are the, the drive-up shots. You're never in it again. None of the interiors, nothing is inside. Uh, it, one, the ballroom is inside. And that actually says something really important, not just about how film is able to create new realities by editing together things that don't belong together. It also says it's what you do. You will construct the same kind of filmic relationships to the buildings and architectures of the city you, you live, and you'll, you'll produce these kind of conglomerations of things that don't exist. It's really, and it it'll helps you tell a story. But what's really beautiful about this scene, I don't know if you can tell it, is... Uh, if you see there's a heater on the left here and a heater on the right there, and you will never see that in a real building. So this, is, this scene is built for the effect of producing symmetry as something that's really scary. So the two red, the two red doors, the two chairs, the two, everything is exactly symmetrical. But for the first time that I know of, symmetry is being used to create a kind of horrifying effect. And when the blood's op blood opens up. And... Now, the architectural thing that interests me most is that there are three characters in the film. There's, there's Jack Nicholson, Shelley Duvall, and some little kid. I can't remember his name. I don't like little kids anyway. But... <clears throat> I know one thing. He was weird. and He did stuff like this. He had a little friend named Tommy that lived in his finger. And he wrote backwards. And he ran around. He made a lot of noise. And I always wanted to see magic tricks. Anyway, Jack Nicholson always stays in the major spaces of the house. He writes in the big grand ballroom. He that's it. Those are the spaces where he is who he is. He's a writer. He, even if he's writing all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, he sits and writes. Everything's fine. He, he gets drunk 
for free in his imagination, which at my age, it starts to sound, you start to really, the idea that you can just imagine yourself drunk is pretty good, I think. It's kind of, but Shelley Duvall is the wife. She always stays in the domestic spaces. There's a little servant's quarters. You rarely see her anywhere else. She's happy there. She goes there to think. She goes there when she's worried. He doesn't like the domestic spaces. Look. What, does anybody, was Ralphie, was that his name? What was his name? Toby? Some, I don't know. Alfalfa? I don't, what was his name? <laughs> Harry? I don't, whatever his name was. Uh, he always stays in what we call the interstitial spaces. Hallways, cupboards, any place that there's not a room. He, that's where he belongs. And th this is the most beautiful picture where symmetry becomes scary you'll ever see. These two twins sitting in that, uh, sort of symmetrical in that hallway, and there's the sound, I don't know if you know, of the, of the rugs going on and off. So the entire building is kind of coming alive, and it's, each character has its own architecture. And the only thing that's interesting, the, what's interesting is the building is all the bad stuff happens when one character gets into some other character's architecture. So there's a... Uh, Jack Nicholson in Shelley Duvall's space, there's, let's call him Tommy, standing outside in the hallway, and, he, and he's trying to coax him in. And you know that's not going to be a good thing. And the whole time, the story gets told, and look at the beautiful mirror, just so you can see. The, you can see the evil on his face. Come here, son. And then... The, the invasion of spaces becomes more aggressive. So the structure, the spatial structure of the, the building is actually setting up the narrative. And he's finally lost it, and he's after his son. And his son saves himself because he understands the small spaces in the building. So he can hide here, but Jack Nicholson, who walks right by them, doesn't think, okay, that's a space someone can go into. For him, it's an ornament. For him, it's a kind of, doesn't belong to the architecture. And so Tommy jumps in there and saves himself. And later on, he actually saves himself again. And finally, because he's in the hedge maze, which for Jack is a big major space with walls, but for the little boy, he crawls through the bushes. So Jack is trying to find him. And he can't find him inside the hedge, but he's able to keep crawling because the little boy keeps crawling through the bushes, and finally Jack freezes to death. You don't always have to get, uh, it doesn't, there always, doesn't have to be a picture. There will always be a picture of architecture. You will always be able to read architecture, you know, that's the kind of stuff we've been talking about. I have two versions of this. I'm not so sure, I don't, I, uh, sometimes it's hard to understand. This is from the Monty Python film Life of Brian. It is, I believe, the single most important piece of political commentary ever written. It's, it's much better than uh, the Constitution of the United States, the Magna Carta, the uh, Declaration of Independence. What are some other good ones? Okay, wait a second, hang on. Here it is. Okay, I guess you can hear it. Now, I think this is a particularly poignant film. Um, the architecture of the scene is quite interesting. He has a prostitute right next to him, and he wants to get these people out of the way, and you can't see him through the window. So the thing is that short, so you can just see that he, there's this naked lady there, and he wants to get right back to his business. And he's just trying to get rid of this crowd, whatever you can. Plus, the space that they're in is small. So there is a way that the scene is set up by the space. But what's particularly interesting here 
is this theme about uh, you're all individuals, yes, we're all individuals. Because that sets up the classic problem of architecture. Um, let's see, I think I have another idea. Okay. So, um, because that's actually, you all think, we all think that. We all think we're individuals and we think we're all different. And yet we scream that out in, in public. And then what happens is the one guy who says, no, I'm not, everybody yells at him. So he's the one guy who's different because he says, I'm not different. And then everybody gets mad at him for saying, I'm not different. OK. Now, you know, basically, this is the problem. We, this, is, this is the problem of the relationship between the individual and the collective taken to its nth degree. And no one knows how to solve this problem. You all want to be individuals, yet you all want to be part of something larger. And it's particularly a problem because architecture seems to do a really good job at serving large, collect, uniform, unified collectivities. If you look at the great architecture of history, no matter where it is in the world, it seems to be an architecture about the spirit of the place as it's dominated by one view of the place, by one population. Well, in the 20th century, that's something we don't want to do. We, we really didn't want to do that. No, in the, all of the art forms and most of the musical forms, you, you want to be able to have different tastes, you want to share different, like you, you have different musical tastes, you have some friends that like some music, some friends that don't like. You wanted some way, you wanted your sense of the way that we are in the world to express this desire of the individual not to be annihilated by the collective because the, it seems like that the collective annihilates the existence of the individual. And of course, we associate that with some of the worst uh, eventualities in history, as, as in fascism. Now, um, this seems to be out of place, but I just thought I'd show you this. This is a, a scene from Woody Allen's uh, Stardust Memory. And it's a kitchen. There's a kitchen, there's this little stereo stuff, there's a kitchen in the other room, and this is his dinette set. What you're seeing on the wall is a very famous picture from the Vietnam War by Eddie Adams. Uh, of a general in the South Vietnamese army at the exact moment he's executing a North Vietnamese prisoner. This picture and one other are basically credited with ch changing the mood in the country against the war. This picture ran everywhere and it's basically, it's considered one of the two or three instruments by which the popular opinion of the middle class in the United States changed against the war because it seems so violent. And what you see in Woody Allen is it's been turned into wallpaper. It's been turned into wallpaper to set a certain kind of mood for the film. And you will see a lot of architecture later on that uses this kind of application of images and these things completely out of context. It was a, quite a controversial photograph because it's, he won a Pulitzer Prize and yet it seemed to be capitalizing on violence. And this was quite a controversial scene in the film because all of a sudden it had been turned into wallpaper. Um, yet it, it, do, it really does the mood of the film, it's a comedy, but it's a dark comedy, and it's a comedy about filmic formalism. He's, a, he's about to face some people coming he doesn't want to come over, they come over. And actually, if you can see in the shot, the, the, the guy on the left is actually imitating the gesture of holding his hands up like a gun to Woody Allen. So it allows a kind of dialogue between what's actually going on in a formal reading meaning we can read the organization of the picture and we can read the organization of the guys on the front and we all of a sudden an echo happens, and an interesting accidental e echo that causes us to think differently about both. Recently, I don't know if you saw this, V is for Vengeance. V is for Vengeance brings us back to the Life of Brian problem. Uh, and V is for Vengeance is maybe one of the best pieces of uh, architectural criticism I've ever seen. Did anybody see it? No, no, that's a different movie. You're saying V is v, v, the Vendetta? No, no, this is a completely different movie. I don't make mistakes like that. So a lot of times I know very rare things that have names that are very similar to what I'm saying. Yeah, v, v, what is it, V for Vendetta, is that it? And this is the bad guy. Uh, bad guys always have gigantic heads and goatees. It turns out he's, he's about that big. It's, it's a nine foot head. Anyway, and uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting is the, the red and white here looks a lot like the Wexner Center 
stuff, but the symmetry in it. Anyway, the sets are set up, but what is the theme of the movie? Does anybody remember? An oppressive government regime has uh, stripped away all the civil liberties and it basically controls the lives of the individuals. So this is the classic execution of the problem of uh, the posed by life of Brian. So what do they decide to do? Does anybody remember? Blow up, blow up parliament. So here's the standoff. So V is for victory. All the V people have a mask on and all the North Star waitresses, or I forget what they're called, North Line, they're called the North Line party. All the, Nor the North Line people, they're facing off against each other. And then they win, and then they unmask, and now they're individuals, right? So all of a sudden, they don't want to be a collective anymore, they want to go back to their individualities. And the way they win is to blow up Big Ben, blow up the parliament. Because architecture, and in 20th century philosophy, you're going to find this over and over and over again, architecture seems to be the perfect instrument for exercising and symbolizing authority of instantiating power relationships, of, of saying who's in power and who is it, who can come inside, who can't come inside, corner offices. And so this idea that the only way you can act against a, a symbol of authority, it's hard to blow up an idea, or it's hard to blow up, even if you kill somebody, but to, to blow up the place that they live or to tear down the Bastille becomes the act by which we oftentimes see civil disobedience against uh, um, instantiated powers. Actually, if you're following the election right now, one of the problems that's constantly being posed by, to Obama is that he was associated with a man named Ayers, and all they say about him was that he, ought, he wanted to blow up buildings. Not he wanted to kill people, not when he wanted to start a revolution. What the weathermen were famous for wanting to do was to blow up buildings. And as a symbolic act, as a symbolic act against, and so every time you build a building, if you're in architecture, it appears that you are actually taking sides and you're always, almost always taking sides with power, with, with people that already have money and already, that already have power. And none of us want to do that. We want to make money and we want to get power by taking sides with people with no money and no power. That's just, that's how it is. Um, sorry, that's, that's what I want to do. Now, that means we have to figure out the prop, this problem is this. After you blow up parliament and you're these people, what happens in the movie? Does anybody remember? We have to rebuild that building. The film can't take up that problem. In fact, uh, and it, yet it's the problem that most of us and most of the stuff we're going to be looking at for the next six or seven weeks or eight weeks is about. It's about that one problem. Um, just a couple of more quick things. Uh, obviously, the relationship between architecture and power and the, the image of architecture is, uh, is, has been deeply implicated in the events around the 9-11. Uh, I don't show the pictures of the violence, but I definitely I think the idea that we have we see a spirit of two buildings in the Tower of Light was, was really a stunning way of understanding that, they, that the buildings live in our memories in that way. Now, if you I don't play a lot of games, but I pulled some stuff off the webs. This is kind of interesting. This is from a game where you actually have to learn the plan. Do you, have you ever heard of militia? It's a game, I don't know, it's some kind of game. You put it in your computer, but you have to read the plan in order to figure out where the bad guys are. This is more like what you expect to see. This is the, the kind of stuff you almost always see in games now. And it's always true. When films first started coming out, it was all about you know, fantastic fantasies, going to the moon, great train robberies. Uh, but slowly, as the gaming environment starts to mature, and as the, you are the, the first generation to grow up, in a gaming environment entirely through your life. You were born, whether you did it or not doesn't matter, your generation was born, it was there already, it was already matured, and you have had a chance to play it all life. Like we went to movies. And then, uh, like my parents went to movies and like I, went, I watched TV. And I, I think more and more and more you're not, I, there's a kind of disconnection between me and the new students, I, because I have no idea what goes on in these games or how they work. And, and y'all seem less and less interested in television. 
I'm not quite sure why that is. Maybe you're just busy. Um, but, you know, so this is going to go away. And pretty soon, that interactive world-building power of these games is going to want to take on more mature stories. And again, we'll start to see a new role for architecture and landscape and the design practices as we imagine what the worlds will be like. But I, would, I just wanted to show you one last clip, and then we'll call it a day. This is a clip, a former student of mine, uh, now kind of a, you know, in, in architecture, everybody's famous. So, I mean, because there's only 100 of us. And you can be famous too. But he was asked by the History of the Channel to imagine what architecture would be like in the future. And basically, this is the kind of stuff you're seeing going on now, and it's just now starting to show up in the game world. And what's particularly interesting about it is it's also starting to show up in the real world. Uh, it's hard to build, and it's really expensive. Now, I heard something for a while. This one, the concept of the Lord of architecture was set up by the printer This idea was set forth by the truth in the age of art. But after the emergence of Corophilia, this idea became obsolete. A new species of architecture has been established, and one that's right in question is the origin of architecture, repositioning therefore creating form. We saw a new species that take on trace of human development and had its own human-like intelligence. Instead of having to program our environment, we allow the environment its own artificial intelligence to grow itself. This new intelligence forced us to reevaluate the settings. It forced us to bring in the ornament of nature. We had to understand the design behind nature and how it applies to our world. We had to bring nature back into the information that it couldn't just be from humans anymore. We had to let it communicate with us however it needed to, to make us understand. Bricks don't put each other on the wrong way. Cells are like a new group. They can reform and recombine and retouch and reconnect in different ways. Buildings have no knowledge of that. They have no understanding of how to realign Discover now that the idea that this building will understand itself, that the connection and parts will constantly shift depending on the situation. It's not stuck. The new plan of Los Angeles is important. Um, what's interesting about this work, and if you decide you want to join the field at some point, you're likely to do this. It's, you see it at every school, and quite a few practitioners practice are doing this. But the, the, the um, boundary condition between the real world and the virtual world and the representative world is really dissolving at a rapid rate because the, the tools are the same. The tools that an architect uses are exactly the same as the tools that an animator uses. And a friend of mine, uh, Alex McDowell, he's, he does the production, he's a production designer in Hollywood. He does stuff like uh, Fight Club and Minority Report. He'll be out here to lecture. I hope you'll come see him. He, he and his colleagues are working on making the, the worlds like this so interactive and so intelligent that you won't even have to think about anything. And it's an interesting problem because I think the problem itself is interesting, but all of a sudden it's a new kind of political power. It's not about authority anymore, but if every need that you have is satisfied without your needing to know how or why, then you become dumbed down and addicted to it, whereas a whole new group of people, which are no longer the politicians and the military people, become empowered, and those are the designers. So I think we close on this note. Next week, uh, this was the high point of the whole quarter. It goes down here from here. We, we start to look at real buildings next week. So thank you. Are there any questions?